industries where there's a lot of cash going around, so the antiques industry, the art industry, uh, second-hand cars industry, they all now have to do AML, which is new to them. And for many of those players, there's a, there's a conflict of interest because they have somebody wanting to pay a nice second-hand car, probably in a large cash amount or something they can't really justify, and they want to sell the car, that's their business. But now they're also obliged to justify that they checked how the source of the sources of money of the acquirer of that good and so i would say where our tools were historically sold in those very regulated industries financial industries we now see a huge uh, expansion opportunity in i would say um, at, the, at the one hand you have uh, for example accountants they're also being pulled into this policing corner now they have to check aml they have to check uh, and anti-money laundering at their customers and notify the right instances. And so this, this industry, as I said, uh, the art industry, the second-hand industry, the auctions, auction houses, they all have to start doing EML in a much more advanced way than they ever did before. And I'm not even telling sanction lists of Russians and other uh, blacklisted uh, countries of origin right now. So I'm Ton van Acht, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Data.be, a Brussels-based uh, RegTech uh, compliance solution provider. Okay. okay our, our core value proposition is that we structure official company information. Companies, nonprofits, everything that's a corporate uh, is being published in several authentic uh, document websites, and we structure the information from there in one unified source that we open both through web tools, SaaS model, and APIs. And so, if you think about that, it's typically about which person is appointed in which role, and that role can he or she in that role sign themselves, or do you need others to sign? So, for the last decade, We've been structuring that information and selling that to banks, insurers, uh, but also to leasing companies. Everybody who's involved now in AML and that has a KYC, a know your customer, or in our case, more specifically, a know your business type of, of need. I keep looking at you, right? Yes, yeah, okay, that's fine. Very good, yeah. um, all right, and um, what's, what would you say is the, is the main problem that you're trying to solve? So the main problem is that for people in the financial industry who work at banks, insurers, and leasing companies, they have to, when they get a contract with a name on it, assigned the conditions of that contract, they have to make sure that this person is duly representing the legal entity with whom they will open a credit line, a card, or whatever, a leasing a, a, a card that, will, that they will deliver based on that signature. But they have to make very sure that the person putting that signature on the contract, whether it's digitally or on paper, is the right person who can represent that company. And so they spend a lot of time in looking through both bylaws, like what has the company published on representation, official databases and next to that they do a little bit of risk analysis of course how healthy is that customer are they growing will they be able to pay the bills or the, the financial engagements with, uh, that we are closing with them? and so we we deliver both the text information and structured format so they, they gain time they can basically process a lot more customer files uh, than they, they were able in the past by using our tools and secondly we offer them the financial data that go with it the employment data that go with it we we deliver alerts Every morning we check has a company maybe gone bankrupt or not, uh, if it's a customer or even for prospects. Have they been hiring? Are they growing? Uh, should you be careful? Did they merge with another company? So that you probably have to reach out to see who are the new counterparts. The company is still there, the, the contracts are all valid, they're doing well. But you have to change probably the interfacing, maybe the email addresses, stuff like that, where you're going to be sending your bills over. What makes us unique is that for the last 12 years already, um, we've, been, we've been doing OCR, optical character recognition, 
from published PDFs. So we've been processing millions of documents, very boring corporate bylaws, and we've been doing entity recognition. So we find a name, a birth date, an address, a company reference in there. But also we do semantics analytics. So we, we're going to look at the meaning of words in a sentence to say, OK, this part of the sentence is about representation. And somebody who's appointed as an administrator can solely sign on behalf of the company. And so we structure this and through our APIs. We offer it to financial institutions. So it's a cat and mouse game, of course, eh? especially with everything through and related to AI and chatbots. You can now automate a lot of, of attack factors, as, they were, as they're called. Uh, where in the past, it was very cumbersome for fraudsters to do that. that they can automate it and look for the, the loopholes. But, but, but when you look at our part of this business of identifying who can, who can sign under which role, is the identification part that's crucial. In Belgium, we have It's Me. So if, if, you have, if you do a digital onboarding and you include one of those strong customer authentication methods, it's already become much harder to pretend you're somebody else. Now imagine that through some way you manage to scam that person to give away their strong authentication to the two-factor authentication or whatever you've implemented in your internal procedure. Then, then you have a person re that is the second text, I would say, prevention we do is that this person, we're going to check that indeed are they duly and able to sign on behalf of that company and do we see strange things happening. So for example, there's a type of fraud where somebody does this and then publishes their name as a, as a layman for a company. We have the list of these, these criminals who do that as a living, I would say. So we say, oh, attention. Or if you're going to have a huge transaction and everybody, the address has been changed in the last week and there's a new director in place and everything. And you see in the history of the company doesn't make sense, then we can also give a higher risk score to this sort of event. So we look at several types of events and how they are being uh, used or misused in the back in the, in the past, and then we put a risk score on that. Right, right. Well, we've seen, first of all, there is the fines. That's the negative part of it. Yeah? There's more and more regulation, and in a certain way, at the, at the macro trend, you see that governments are putting the policing not just at what were typically the police and the judges and the, and the special inspectors they have for this, but they're putting it down into the industrial change. It's okay, there's fraud. We're gonna oblige the banks to do very strong authentication and compliance. And if they see a suspicious transaction, they have to stop it and they have to warn us about it. And so the giving fines, it started with banks that they had to do it. Now it's going down in the, in the whole industrial chain. Leasing companies start to have to do it. If you look abroad in, 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 in Europe, in Belgium, we don't have fines in those industries yet. But for example, uh, everybody doing um, industries where there's a lot of cash going around. So the antiques industry, the art industry, uh, second-hand cars industry, they all now have to do AML, which is new to them. And for many of those players, there's a, there's a conflict of interest because they have somebody wanting to pay a nice second-hand car probably in a large cash amount or something they can't really justify and they want to sell the car, that's their business. But now they're also obliged to justify that they checked how the source <laughs> of the sources of money of the acquirer of that good. And so I would say where our tools were historically sold in those very regulated industries, financial industries, we now see a huge uh, expansion opportunity in, I would say, mm, at the, at the one hand, you have, uh, for example, accountants. They're also being pulled into this policing corner now. They have to check AML, they have to check uh, the anti-money laundering at their customers and notify the right instances. And so this, this industry, as I said, uh, the, the art industry, the second-hand industry, the auctions, auction houses, they all have to start doing AML in a much more advanced way than they ever did before. And I'm not even telling sanction lists of Russians and other uh, blacklisted uh, countries of origin. Right now. So in, in the next five years, right now we're active in Belgium. We're looking at adding the same type of tools and information in other countries. So that's one. But what I what I mainly see is trying to we are like, we have like the we go the deepest for the Belgian uh, business information. And so I would, our tools that we are extending on APIs, we would like to integrate them further than just the financial industry. But as we see that regulation is expanding to new markets, we would li also like to provide these tools to these new markets. Right. Well, 
Well, one of the first words that come up is uh, humble. We're probably too humble. You know? I have the pleasure to travel to other fintech uh, events uh, across Europe. And then you, you go to countries and you see how people boast about what they've been doing. And then you ask some questions and you see like, okay, it's an MVP, they don't have real customers yet, but it's as if they've been serving a market for a decade with something that was really innovative. And so in Belgium, we tend to be a little bit too humble and too honest um, when we present our products. Like, yeah, still it, it works, but it's still in progress. But if you onboard, we'll, together we'll build it and it works. So it's, it's about being, uh, I would say, a, a, not bragging, but about li being a little bit more proud in the way we go out. Uh, linked to that humbleness is the fact that we have very strong uh, technical skills. We have great, uh, highly educated people. We have a lot of um, experience in Belgium. If you, if you think about the history, we call it FinTech today, but about um, the companies that were founded here a long time ago, like Swift or Euroclear, they were from the beginning very technical and they found the talent here and, and, and everything that goes around that and the, the legal entities. And so it's a little bit of pity that we've had all this from Belgium and that now we have to try to find our ground and, 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 and stand out as a fintech country yeah. when we have this huge legacy in, this in, in, in the financial uh, industry. Um, and again, to me, if you look at those examples, mm, uh, I, I said humble uh, as, as, as one thing I think about. The, the second one I think about is the technical uh, talent that we have. So that's something we really stand out. And then it's B2B. Because we're not like uh, <laughs> making uh, ourselves um, uh, and being so proud in consumer-facing products, a lot of our successful uh, fintechs and regtechs are B2B based. So you don't see them as big brands, but they're serving a lot of other companies underneath through their APIs, um, the, the whole industry of PSD2, of opening finance. Uh, we have players that, that are, are growing even globally from those sectors, uh, but they're not known as household names yet.